Good day, everyone. My name is David Williams, Executive Director of the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Economics of Hydrogen Markets, Underlying Costs and Support Schemes. We're grateful to Dr. Mackiel Mulder from the University of Groningen for today's timely discussion. First, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest uh, we, we provide a, uh, a full lineup of products and services to address the needs of uh, practicing energy economists. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations along with a host of other products and services you can find on our website at www.iaee.org. If you're not already a member of the organization, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our speaker. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot attend today's live event. If you have questions for our speaker, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window and type your question. We've allocated sufficient time at the end of this webinar to address your questions. And now I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Mackie L. Mulder, Professor of Regulation of Energy Markets and Director of the Center for Energy Economics Research at the University of Groningen. Mackiel, over to you. Thank you, David. Good, good day to all of you. Welcome to this uh, webinar. I'm really pleased that you have joined this uh, webinar about economics of hydrogen. And in this session, I would like to discuss the underlying cost, the current cost, the outlook for the future cost, and to what extent there is a need for support. And this presentation is based on joint research with colleagues of mine in my Center for Energy Economics Research, Peter Pierre, Dan Hilsoft, and Bernard Recker. I have divided this uh, presentation in four blocks. I would like to continue presenting during the block, but after each block to have some time for answering your questions. First block, I would like to go briefly into the background. So what are the different types of hydrogen? What are the policy targets? Really briefly, then have some discussion. Then going into the first real issue, which is what are the current costs of hydrogen? Uh, what are the underlying factors? And the third block is going into the future. How? To what extent can we expect that hydrogen production will be competitive in the future? Looking to the efficiency of electrolyzed plants, carbon prices, electricity prices, and etc. And finally, the final block is going into the question: do we need to give support for hydrogen? So please ask your question through the chat, and then after each block, we will have time to, to go into the discussion. Uh, we would like to end at about five o'clock in Dutch time, so in, in one hour, maybe one hour and 15 minutes. First, introducing hydrogen. So there are different types. Basically, hydrogen can be produced based on fossil fuels, like through uh, steam methane reforming, SMR, and this is called gray hydrogen, can be called gray hydrogen, and this is the most uh, actual way of, of making hydrogen. And the other option to make hydrogen is through electrolysis using electricity, which is produced by using power plants, of course. And if this is just normal electricity, not specified, we call it, we may call this gray hydrogen. But of course, we would like to have green hydrogen, which is not just based on normal or general electricity, but we would like to have electricity produced through renewable sources like wind turbines and solar panels. But hydrogen produced through fossil fuels can also be clean. This is what can be called blue hydrogen. It's just a name, but this refers to hydrogen, which is produced by, uh, for instance, steam and fairy forming, while the, the carbon coming from this production process is captured and stored, and it's plus CCS. So we are having at least four different types of hydrogen. And the economics of these different hydrogen sources depend on, of course, the efficiency, the efficiency of uh, steam and fan reforming, efficiency of electrolysis, 
and of course also the different prices and the price of electricity, price of natural gas, price of carbon permits and the price of green certificates. So in, in order to determine the economics of different hydrogen sources, we have to analyze all these different components. That's what we are going to do. But the policy uh, attention is, as I have said, mostly directed to the green hydrogen based on electricity. So if you look, for instance, at the European Union, European Union, European Commission has published a hydrogen strategy report in July this year, stating and that they want to have a large scale deployment of clean hydrogen. And they believe this is really important to achieve the climate policy objectives. They also believe that renewable hydrogen produced through electrolysis based on renewable electricity can play a major role in balancing the electricity system. And they also believe that this can be in particular play a role when electricity is abundant and cheap. Another objective related to this is the ambition to promote the production of hydrogen and to pr promote the production of electrolysis within Europe, and which will may have several economic benefits in terms of employment and economic growth. And finally, finally, the idea is to have, at the end of the day, within a number of years, a large number of large-scale electrolysis which are located close to demand centers, meaning refineries, steel plants, chemical complexes, and also directly links and really close to uh, renewable electricity production. For this is the view of European Commission regarding clean hydrogen. Can be really important, play a role in electricity systems, can create em uh, employment. But the problem is it's quite expensive. And that's what we are going to discuss. How expensive? And what, are, what is the future outlook and to what extent can we, should we give additional support? Are there any questions up to now? I see one question. The slides will be made available to all the attendees, yes. Anything else that you would like to discuss? Mekiel, I suggest uh, you proceed and uh, we will periodically prompt our, the attendees to use the Q&A function in Zoom. I'm seeing a few questions. Uh, for the presentation is directed at hydrogen supply conditions. So mainly for enough electricity just for making hydrogen. So what's the economics? Another question is about remark by Robert Hoffner that hydrogen can also be produced by using renewable gas, of course, that is true. I will not go into this, but you, instead of using natural gas, you can also use renewable gases. And the other question is, can hydrogen be used in CCS fields? Now, not hydrogen itself, but if you make hydrogen based on gas or natural gas, then you will have carbon, uh, CO, CO or CO2. And this can be uh, stored in a CCS field while using hydrogen. I'm not precisely aware whether there are similar initiatives in the US, but I believe uh, in many regions of, around the globe, uh, governments are promoting uh, hydrogen production, but maybe the most in Europe, but maybe someone else knows from the audience. I believe these are the two major sources uh, to make uh, hydrogen, either through gas, can be natural gas, renewable gas, or electrolysis. Now the question refers to the source of electricity. 
indeed for making hydrogen, we will are going to discuss this. In order to make uh, uh, hydrogen for electrolysis, you need electricity. And electricity can be generated in several ways, including nuclear power. But I believe the, the policy makers, the European Commission at least, want to promote clean, uh, clean hydrogen, which is based on renewable energy, which is defined as wind and solar mainly. So many questions. Uh, I take a few minutes and then I continue with the next block. Uh, on the transport, yeah, indeed it is possible to transport hydrogen using the existing natural gas pipeline network. Of course, you need to make some adaptations, but it seems to be possible, not really costly as well. Now the question refers to the demand side. My presentation is mainly on the cost because I assume that consumers can be the industry, can be transport, can be consumers. They use energy carrier uh, and that means that you will choose the most efficient one. So that's why it's important to compare the cost of hydrogen by the cost of the prices of the alternatives. Unless, and this is also possible, of course, that some consumers have a preference for using hydrogen above any other carry, energy carrier. And then there can be a market for hydrogen. But this is not really likely to be a large market. So my basic assumption is that industries will look for the cheapest energy carrier. The European Commission has in its uh, energy, hydrogen strategy report and published this summer uh, definition of a different type of hydrogen. And they define renewable uh, electricity hydrogen as hydrogen which is produced through wind and solar. So not from nuclear power plants. So thanks for now, I, for all these questions, only for the first part, just as introduction, that we all have the same understanding of the different types and the policy targets. Let's first continue with the second block. This is about the, the cost of making hydrogen. And afterwards we can have the same type of discussion. So I would like to, to compare the different costs of different technologies to make hydrogen and therefore I use the concept of break-even prices. So we determine the investment cost per, uh, per technology, the capex, also the variable cost resulting in the opex, and then we get a break-even price of hydrogen in euros per kilogram. So this is the minimum required price for making hydrogen. And this price gives a, a return on all the costs, the investment costs and all the operational costs. And if the actual hydrogen price is below this break-even price, a rational investor will not invest in that, in that technique. That's the, uh, that's the idea. So let's first look at the steam and fan reforming. Um, this is hydrogen produced through natural gas. And the required hydrogen price, of course, by definition, depends on natural gas price, which we see on the horizontal axis in this graph. Vertical axis gives the required hydrogen price. And if you plot this, we see if you use the Cray technology without storing, capturing, and storing carbon, you see this relationship. Now, in the past 10 years, the gas price was on average 20 euros per megawatt hour, and this results in a price of 1.5 euro per kilogram. This was about the actual price of hydrogen, which is paid by the industry. But we can also have more cleaner. Uh, kinds of fo fossil fuel based hydrogen. And there are different technologies depending on the efficiency of the how much carbon is captured. If you have a capture rate of 54%, uh, costs are, are of course lower. It seems that the maximum capture rate is about 90%, 89%. 
which is more costly. So this gives a spread between different costs for steam methane reforming hydrogen. This is what you call blue hydrogen, or can be called blue hydrogen, and the required price for a cash price of 20 euros between 1.6 and 2 euros. Going to electrolysis, and here the required price of hydrogen depends on the price of green certificates and the price of electricity. So on the horizontal axis, we see the electricity price, vertical axis, the required hydrogen price again. The gray line refers to the gray electricity. Gray hydrogen just using electricity. But if you want to have green hydrogen, then you also need to be sure that your electricity is produced in a renewable way. And therefore you can buy green certificates. And in the Netherlands, for instance, some consumers would like to have hydrogen, which is produced by using electricity, which is generated by renewable sources in the Netherlands. And if, you, if this is your preference, you have to pay more for these green certificates. And the current price for these certificates, referring to renewable electricity produced in the Netherlands, is about five euros, while the ordinary general green certificate price is about one or two euros per, per megawatt hour. The average price of electricity about in the, over the past 10 years was about 45 euros per megawatt hour. So this means just a simple calculation that the required price for electrolysis is about three euros per kilogram, about twice as high as for steam and fan reforming, just because of the level of the, of the electricity price. And if you compare the different technologies based on steam and fan reforming and electrolysis, we get this picture. I have not included uh, steam and fan reforming using green gas but this would not really uh, change the picture. But you see on the left side, the cost of steam methane reforming without storing your carbon. Steam methane reforming is blue, a capture rate of 54%. And if you want to have the highest possible capture rate of carbon, then we have a minimum required price of about 1.60. And a major part of this cost refer to the uh, capture and storing uh, CO2. And if you compare this to electrolysis, then you see indeed electrolysis is about twice as expensive. And if you want to have electrolysis produced in the Netherlands based on Dutch uh, renewable en energy, and the cost is about three euros. And this, of course, depends on your assumptions regarding uh, the price of natural gas, price of electricity, price of CO2 allowances, which are depicted in the bottom graph, bottom table. So here we assumed the current price of gas, 50 euros, current electricity price, CO2 price of 50 euros. But in the current circumstances, steam and fan reforming hydrogen is way more competitive than the other technologies. But the question is, under which circumstances will electrolysis hydrogen become profitable, competitive. That depends on the relationship between the cash price and electricity price. And this is depicted by these break-even lines. The gray line is the break-even line between the gray steam and fan reforming hydrogen and green electrolysis. So if the cash price is say 20 euros, the electricity price needs to be uh, below 16 euros per megawatt hour in order to make electrolysis hydrogen competitive. And for steam and fan reforming, with the highest the capture rates, the electricity price needs to be below 25 euros per megawatt hour. So these are just the facts based on the current technologies and the current costs. And if you compare this with the actual prices, the realized prices in the past, then we see and there's a huge spread gap between what is needed to make technologies electrolyzed profitable and the realized prices. So only looking at this, maybe there's a case for giving support for electrolysis, but we will come back to this at the end. So concluding on this second block, 
Electrical, electricity based hydrogen is currently about twice as expensive as fossil fuel based hydrogen. It can only compete with fossil fuel based hydrogen when the gas price is really high and electricity price is low. But the question is is this feasible, this combination? And the required electricity price is much lower than prices in the past. This also implies, and that may be also answers one of the questions in the previous uh, chat, that electricity-based hydrogen cannot compete with natural gas for heating, for instance, or electricity because of all the conversion losses. If electricity-based hydrogen is not, compet not uh, competitive with fossil fuel-based hydrogen, it's also not competitive with natural gas or electricity. I believe most of the experts agree about these conclusions, but the question is, will this change in the future? Will these circumstances change? That will be the topic of the next block. But before, maybe we can go into your, your questions on this, and this data on the current cost. So we will come back to, to the uh, issue of uh, electrolysis uh, production, if it is directly linked to renewable electricity uh, generation. Question by Mathieu. I will also come back to the question by Jörg about the number of hours of electricity that it may be rather cheap or even negative. Question, why is the price of green certificates added to the cost? Because it's an additional cost. If you want to make green hydrogen through electrolysis, then you need to have electricity. Then you need to have electricity contract. You have to buy electricity on the wholesale market. But if you want to call this hydrogen green, then you also need to be sure that your electricity is green and therefore you need to buy additional certificates. So that's why the price of these certificates have to be added to the cost of electricity use. I will also show in a minute the impact of higher carbon prices. Someone asked about oil-based hydrogen costs. Uh, I'm not aware of these costs. We only have looked into natural gas. I believe this was the major source of making hydrogen. And Charles is making a remark that electricity prices are tied to the natural gas prices. I will also come back to this in the next slides, next block. And indeed, if you make your hydrogen directly on the location of electricity generation of wind farm, then there's no need to buy a green certificate fee. That is true. And there's also no impact of carbon prices. So I propose to, 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 to proceed now with the next block because many of the questions refer to the to the future. So the first question is, so if you agree on these conclusions, hydrogen is also said by the European Commission in its, in its strategy report, currently electricity-based hydrogen is too expensive. But maybe expect that the cost will come down. So what will be the future like? So what if electrolysis become more efficient? And that's the idea by increasing the scale of electricity of, uh, of, um, these plants, electrolyzed plants, by increasing the scale, the cost will go down due, due to economies of scale of learning effects. So we have made analysis, just a sensitive analysis by assuming what will be the break-even lines if the efficiency increases from 72%, what is now the standard, the average efficiency of electrolysis to 80%. So here we see the break-even line in the base case, 
And if we raise the efficiency, then we get the orange line. For the required electricity price, it can be higher in order to become profitable. And if we lower the capex, say the total investment cost reduced by 20%, which is significant, I believe, then we arrive at the green line. And if you combine this, so efficiencies are higher from 72 to 80%, capex is 20% lower, then we are on the red uh, break even line. And which means, that and the break even price of electricity can be about six euro per megawatt higher. Instead of if the cash price is 50 euros, now we need a price of 20 euros, the maximum price, but then the electricity price can be 26 euros, which is a significant increase, about 20 or 30 percent, but it's still uh, way below. And the red star, which indicates the past realized prices of electricity. So this means that either electricity prices would need to become much lower, or the efficiency improvements would be higher than 80%, which is already quite high, or we need to have realized more economies of scale, more than 20%, way more than 20%. Another measure is of other uh, future development refers to the uh, future uh, carbon price. Uh, one of the participants asked about the impact of higher carbon prices. Does it help to raise the price of carbon? Now, if you look at steam methane reform and hydrogen, yes, it helps. And the green of the gray line refers to the gray hydrogen based on natural gas, and the blue is all based on uh, uh, steam methane reform plus CCS. And at a price of about 50 euros per ton, then blue hydrogen is competitive. It's more profitable than gray. Then the industries now using gray hydrogen have incentive to make uh, the choice to change to uh, blue hydrogen. But then discussing electricity. A higher price of, of CO2 also makes electrolysis more expensive. And that's due to the fact that cash fired power plants are in many countries still the price setting plants. Higher carbon price affects their marginal costs. So, a higher carbon price means higher marginal costs for electricity generation and raising the, the cost for electrolysis. So, a higher carbon price raises the minimum required price for hydrogen by electrolysis. And as already said by one or a few of the participants, the price of electricity is closely related to the price of gas and CO2. Here we see a graph with the blue lines, the electricity day ahead price since 2015, the daily price. The red line refers to the gas, TTF, day ahead price. And the green line refers to the EU carbon prices, futures contract prices. And we see in the, in the beginning, earlier years, the electricity price closely follows the cash price. But since the last year, we see, particularly this year, and the green line is going up, the carbon prices are going up, and also electricity prices are going up, while the cash price is quite low from a historical perspective. And now the electricity price is again back to a level of about 40 euros per megawatt hour, almost a historical average. That which is to a large extent due to the high carbon prices. So this shows that in the current system, electricity prices are closely connected to the carbon prices. Due to the fact that gas fired power plants are in several countries price setting plants. But this may be changed and what you, what is, what is some, sometimes said due to the search the increase in Renewable generation, we will have more often low prices. But is this already, already the case? Can we expect much lower power prices if renewables increase? For instance, in Germany, Germany, we already have installed capacity of more than 100 gigawatts. For several days, there's no need for any additional generation. In the Netherlands, we are having about 10 gigawatts, about one third 
in terms of installed capacity. And it's really important to look at all the different countries because we are having an integrated European market, not only the, between the Netherlands and Germany, France and Belgium, but we're also linked to the Norwegian market, the British market. And this has a strong impact on the price patterns in different countries. For instance, if you look at the price duration curve of 2019 in Germany and the Netherlands, we get this picture. I would have expected myself that we would see much more price differences, stronger price differences, and also more often really low prices in Germany. But this, is not, this is not what we see. Most of the times, the prices are almost equal, maybe a small difference. German prices are a bit lower because of the high production by renewables and the constraints on the border for importing from Germany to the Netherlands. But most of the time, we are quite close to each other. Only a number of hours, maybe 500 hours per year or so, there's a stronger difference. So I believe that the market integration we have realized within Europe reduces the impact of renewables on prices. There's more flexibility within the markets. So if you look at the histogram of the same prices for the Netherlands and Germany, you see almost the same pattern. And indeed we see in Germany only a few percentage of all hours in which we are having really low prices or really negative prices. And this is what you would like to have when talking about how to turn production. The European Commission also refers in her, in her strategy document, how to turn becomes profitable, it's really attractive in, in times of cheap and abundant renewables. But we don't see yet uh, really cheap electricity. Despite the enormous uh, investment in renewables in Germany, prices are quite, quite high in my field. So this is just looking at empirical facts. And due to the fact that the marginal cost of the cash fire power plant to remain price setting for many hours, but looking into the economics of electricity markets, can we expect the prices will become really low for many hours in a year? And then yeah, my answer is not really, because investors in renewable energy also need high prices. And we are having a peak load price system, energy only markets, where the prices are determined by the marginal cost in cases of abundant capacity. But investors look at peak prices and the spread between the peak price and the marginal cost. And this gives them incentive to, to invest. And if there is no, no capacity, uh, uh, no scarcity in capacity, prices will remain low and no investment will be made. This also means for the offshore wind parks, which are increasingly built without subsidy, they also require high electricity prices. So no one is going to build an offshore wind park without subsidy if they expect many hours of really low prices. No investor is going to build for oversupply. So that's why even in, situ even in the long term, prices will be determined by the levelized cost of energy of of the additional capacity. This also holds for the situation some participants refer to when you make hydrogen close to a wind farm. Also in that case, the cost, levelized cost of energy of the wind farm is relevant. So it doesn't matter actually. So what are the findings of this third block, the conclusions? So we need to have higher efficiency or lower investment costs and this can be realized through economies of scale, but these are likely not sufficient to make hydrogen, uh, electrolysis hydrogen profitable. Higher carbon prices can be expected. This is also the policy, carbon, uh, climate policy will be more tight, but this will raise the cost of electrolysis hydrogen. But this is not good for the business case of electrolysis. And lower electricity prices 
are not really likely as investors in generation capacity need higher prices. So under what circumstances can electrolysis hydrogen become competitive? I have defined the following situation. So when we have high prices of natural gas, that requires that that is a tight global gas market. Current gas price is quite low, 10 to 15 euros per megawatt, much below the long-term long average. But we need a really tight gas market and high carbon prices, which is likely because of a more fierce climate policy. And then, and this should result in sufficient number of hours with high power prices to make investments in renewable power profitable on the one hand. And you also would like to have many hours, sufficient number of hours of low power prices to make electrolysis profitable. But this is conceivable to have such a uh, situation in which the market gives incentives for investment in electrolysis. But how to influence this? Gas price cannot be influenced by national governments, not even by the European Commission. It's a global market. And because of the climate policy, it's more likely to expect lower cash prices than higher cash prices. So before going to the discussion on support, I would like to open the floor again for, for questions. For the question by Deborah, indeed, that's, that's what I just have answer, uh, answered. So low electricity prices are not attractive for construction of wind farms. Yeah, if governments give more support for renewable electricity uh, investments, of course, then the econ economics change. But currently, governments are more and more moving towards uh, auctioning of uh, slots for offshore wind parks without subsidies. On the relationship between the cost of hydrogen and the CO2 cost. Uh, if you make uh, hydrogen for electrolysis, you need electricity. Electricity price in the market is related to the carbon price. So that's the relationship. But if you directly buy electricity, say through a power purchase agreement with a wind farm producer, and then the electricity price is not directly relevant. But the wind farm producer will also look at the expected future electricity price when making a deal with you. So it has always remained relevant in the negotiations on the, on the contract. But directly, there's no impact of the carbon price, but indirectly it affects electricity price. And it also, in that way, affects the opportunity cost for investments, investors in, in the wind farm. But nevertheless, if you are an investor in a wind farm and you are going to conclude a power purchase agreement with electrolyzer plants, then you want that the price accretable is sufficient to compensate for your long-term costs, the levelized cost of energy. And this seems to be about 40 euros per megawatt hour. If the price is lower than that, it's not profitable to build an offshore wind farm. Question about the impact of the stabilization of a grid. If you have less conventional power plants anymore, we need more renewables, then we will need more flexible power plants. So the first impact will be more price volatility, but this will be an incentive for investments in peak power plants. And this is what the market will, will do. So at the end of the day, we will have a different generation portfolio.
an other option, which is often said, is to make uh, hydrogen through electrolysis in, say, the north of Africa, and then because of the low electricity prices, and then transport this hydrogen through pipelines to, to Europe. But according to our calculations, this is also quite expensive because of the cost of building a pipeline infrastructure. And also the cost of electrolyzer plants are quite, will be the same in Africa as or in Europe. Only the capacity factor will, is higher, of course. Question about nuclear power plant, is this essential for hydrogen future? And the question is to what extent a nuclear power plant really fits within a system where you have a lot of renewable generation. If there is a lot of wind farms and solar panels, then utilization of other generation techniques will be lower, such as nuclear power plants, which makes investments in a nuclear power plant less attractive. So I believe it's, it's not, this, this does not well fit to its order. For hydrogen, you would like to have really low electricity prices, but nuclear power plant is quite expensive. And nuclear power plants need to have much higher prices than their own marginal cost. Otherwise they cannot, they will not have sufficient returns on investment. It was really interesting to know what is the willingness to pay of firms, of consumers for green hydrogen. So one of my PhDs have recently published uh, an article about uh, the willingness to pay of consumers for uh, green energy compared to conventional fossil fuel energy. And from this research follows an uh, average price of about 200 euros per ton. So there is a market if you can uh, give the consumer sufficient trust in the system, there can be a market for green hydrogen in which you can realize a higher price. If you compare a question about the cost of a hydrogen car compared to a gasoline car, if you ignore taxes, because taxes are a major component of the cost, then I believe hydrogen is more expensive due to the conversion losses. And first you have to make hydrogen and then you are burning it again. I also believe a hydrogen car is more ex expensive, less efficient than an electricity car due to the losses of the conversion. Okay, thanks for uh, this uh, question. Let's continue with the last block answering, going to the question, should we give support for, for hydrogen production for electrolysis? Because the conclusion is in the past, of, until now, the costs are way too high. Looking into the future, they will remain likely high because of the higher carbon prices, the relatively high electricity prices, and we need way more efficiency improvements than what can be reasonably expected. So why giving support for hydrogen? That will be, should be the first question. And then the question is, what are the market failures? Is there any remaining negative externality of carbon emissions? Or are there positive externalities for the electricity markets? What was also mentioned by the European Commission, benefits for for balancing, providing flexibility. Are there externalities related to research and development? I will in particular go into the first two externalities. First, first one. So if you look at this picture again, how hydrogen can be produced, we already see that the externality of carbon emissions is already priced in different ways. And the, and the conclusion is cost of green hydrogen are way higher than cost of blue hydrogen or natural gas or electricity. But the carbon price is already included in the electricity price. As we have seen, carbon price also affects the cost of fossil fuel based hydrogen. 
to make uh, gray hydrogen through steam methane reforming, and there are uh, emissions to the air, you have to, to buy uh, permits. So these costs are included in the required price for gray hydrogen. We also see that renewable electricity is subsidized a lot, not offshore that much anymore, but onshore. And government already gives, up, gives up a lot of subsidies for renewable electricity generation. And what we also see in many countries that the government adds a tax to the price of gas use. So as a consumer, if you want to make a choice either to use natural gas or maybe switch to hydrogen, then you already have incentive if the tax, the gas price also includes a tax component. So it remains to be seen whether there is really an, an additional negative externality which is not already priced. In my view, this externality is already priced in the whole supply chain. But there's also an order issue in looking at this externality. Because what are the additional benefits in terms of carbon emissions of promoting an electrolysis based hydrogen? Electrolysis, of course, increases the demand for electricity. And if the supply of renewable electricity remains the same, it's exogenous, driven by subsidy schemes, etc., it's just uh, exogenous development, it will always happen, no matter what happens with hydrogen. And we will see more competition for green electricity. So other users of green electricity, consumers, other industries have to pay more for being able to, to say, I am using green electricity. But what is more important, we also need more other types of generation to meet other demands. If a renewable generation is mainly determined by subsidies, is determined by government policy, the demand for electricity increases, then we need more other conventional technologies. So in my view, promoting hydrogen electrolysis means also promoting investments in order more conventional gas fire generation. So if an industry replaces natural gas by hydrogen, that industry may claim, I am now using clean energy, if it is produced through uh, renewable electricity, but at the end of the day, the whole system requires more electricity generation by conventional technologies. So there's a shift of the gas consumption for, from industry to the power sector. So maybe this is a bold statement, but I'm really looking forward to your response. I don't see much environmental benefits of promoting renewable hydrogen. So that's one argument. There's also an other argument for giving subsidies, which is refers to the benefit in terms of providing flexibility to the grids. For instance, one of the plans which exists in the Netherlands is to combine all the offshore wind parks with islands where you can produce hydrogen immediately from the, from the electricity produced by these uh, wind farms. If we would do this, we would save on constructing an offshore grid. And if you can, if you're able to use the existing natural gas network, which exists, which is in place on the North Sea, then you would save uh, all the cost of network. So this can be the solution. But what are the costs and benefits of this, this option? There are really high costs of producing hydrogen directly from electricity from a wind park. And this goes into a uh, number of questions already, already raised. If you produce hydrogen immediately from a wind park, then the capacity factor of the wind farm transfers to the capacity factor of the electrolysis plant. And when an electrolysis plant is connected to the grid, the capacity factor can be 100%. But if it is connected to a wind farm, then it drops to less than 50%. And that means that the capex increases a lot in the capex per unit of output. You need a high return in order to have sufficient compensation for your fixed cost. And you also will have a lower technical efficiency, which means you will have a higher OPEX. 
So this means that the required price for hydrogen production is much higher. The benefits can be that you save on aircraft costs, that you don't need to build an offshore electricity grid if you can use an existing gas grid. Now, using information on these costs of existing grids, we have estimated these network savings. And these are our tentative results for uh, offshore hydrogen production in the Netherlands on the island. And what we see is in the, the bar in the middle, the required hydrogen price for hydrogen production on the island. There's a really low capacity factor, which drops from almost 100% to 50%, and a lower technical efficiency. And the required price increases to almost four euros. But there are some savings on the network, and we estimate these savings about to be about uh, one euro, more than one euro per kilogram. Because another cooperator doesn't need to build the offshore grids. So the network operator has an incentive to compensate the electrolyzer firm for these savings, but these and these payments will not be sufficient to make electrolysis compatible, competitive with uh, blue hydrogen. So it seems that the benefits for flexibility do exist, and you can produce and can save electricity more efficiently. It can be transported as a molecule, as hydrogen, but these savings are not sufficient, in my view, to compensate, compensate for, the, for the extra cost. So concluding on support, then we're all, almost at the end of this, uh, this hour. Carbon externality, which is the main reason to promote hydrogen, is already priced in the cost of hydrogen, in the price of electricity, the price of natural gas, as well as in the cost of the competing energy carriers. So from this respect, there's no need to, to get subsidy from economic point of view. It also seems that electrolysis hydrogen, same regarding the deployment of renewable electricity does not result in net emission reduction, but it just shifts the use of gas from one industry to another. Electro Electrolysis may have benefits for the grid, but then the network operator has incentive to pay for these benefits. So this would not require support by the government it can just be paid by the network operator who has incentive because it, it saves all its costs. But it seems from the tentative analysis we have done that these benefits are not sufficient to make electrolysis hydrogen profitable. But finally, according to research and development, there may be a case to promote, give support in order to help the industry to reduce the, the cost to improve the efficiency. This may be efficient from an economic point of view. Because my conclusion is not giving support for the massive deployment of electrolysis for helping industries to use electricity, uh, hydrogen based on, on electricity, but just giving support to help the industry to reduce the cost of hydrogen generation. That can be efficient. These are my conclusions. I'm looking forward to your uh, to your responses. And my point on the emission reduction is that in, uh, in order to have an emission reduction, you also need to have additional renewable electricity generation. But all the renewable electricity generation plans already made, independent of what is happening with hydrogen uh, production, these additional renewable power plants will come. So they are exogenous. That means if you, if you promote re, uh, hydrogen production using renewable electricity, 
that other users are not able anymore to use that type of electricity. So they are forced to use other types of electricity. Question is, what are the costs of liquefying and shipping hydrogen from distant regions? I believe we also have made an estimate, it's about one to two euros per kilogram. So it's quite significant. This depends, of course, of the distance, but we have made a calculation where we import hydrogen from the north of Africa to the Netherlands, and we build a pipeline infrastructure. And even if the electricity price is zero in the north of Africa, which is not likely, because these investors also need to have compensation for the fixed cost, if suppose it would be zero, then these hydrogen producers need a hydrogen price of two euros in the Netherlands. Any more questions? So would the business question is would the business case change if you can deliver it to consumers close to the production location? And this analysis, we did not go into the transportation costs, we just compared the production costs. So the location doesn't matter. But maybe can kind of benefit if you sell it to consumers who are sure that this hydrogen is produced in a renewable way, and that you are willing to pay a premium. And this premium can make uh, green hydrogen profitable. Hans Greenfield asked for the breakdown of cost of electrolysis production. And do I have a slide going back? I'm not sure whether it is in. So here you see the breakdown in production cost. I do not have the, the distinction in KPEX and OPEX, but I can provide you this information, Hans. As George is saying, without CO2 free electricity, hydrogen makes no sense. But do you agree? I'm really looking forward to your opinion, to all of you. Do you agree that if we add uh, hydrogen production based on electrolysis, we will not have an additional savings of carbon emissions because it does not add any clean energy to the system? Because the amount of renewable electricity uh, production remains the same. What's your view on this?
So I'm looking for unanswered questions. Daniela asks, does this analysis show the necessity of massively importing hydrogen towards the Netherlands, Belgium and France? No, actually not. It does not say anything about what we should do. It just has shown, in my view, what's the economics and that there is, uh, all the externalities are already priced through regulation, through subsidies, etc. And it's up to the industry whether or not to import or to produce it domestically. But according to our tentative calculations, it is not efficient to import it now because of the high cost of, of imports or building the pipeline infrastructure. Transporting hydrogen is quite expensive. So what should be done, what could be done is try to make the cost of hydrogen production lower. And this is what in my view will be the most important role of, of governments to, yeah, to promote research and development, to reduce the, to realize economies of scale, try to improve the efficiency of the electrolysis. And then it become competitive. And to what extent uh, uh, hard electrolysis can play a role in providing flexibility for electricity system, it really depends on relative prices, on the price duration curves. And electrolysis has to compete with other options for flexibility. It's not the only option markets have. Are there any unanswered questions? Someone asked for the bedrive state or production uh, time. We have assumed in base case analysis 8,000 hours that every electrolyzed plant operates. Dan asks how much electrolysis need to be decreasing cost to become competitive. And if you look at this graph, you see the required price for electrolysis about 2.50 euros, while the competitive price of steam methane reform in blue is 1.50. So it should decrease by about 40%. So also answering the question by Hans, that the cost, the CAPEX should be reduced to kilobit efficiency by about 40% in order to make uh, electrolysis competitive. Mark asked whether uh, electrolysis can become favorable in 2035. And when we are moving towards fairly low 
uh, the mission future. So what you need to have a system of many hours of really low prices. And this can indeed occur when there are, and we all have a lot of renewable electricity generation with say about 6,000 hours of really low prices that's sufficient for the electrolysis to become profitable and the remaining of the hours really high prices which are sufficient for the investors and renewable generation to become profitable. So that's the challenge. We need to have a situation in which both types of investments are profitable. And this is this can happen. If you have really high carbon prices, then we will may have really high electricity prices when cash fire power plants are the price setting plants. And for the remaining of the time, the prices are determined by the really low marginal cost of renewables. So that's the situation I could see in which uh, renewable electricity uh, driven highly term is profitable. Someone asked about the price for green gas premium is higher than in the Dutch market. So we, in the Netherlands, but also in other countries, there are also certificates for green gas. Uh, this price is about one or two euros per megawatt hour. There's no subsidy, but consumers and also firms can choose green gas. And retailers in that case have to buy these certificates from the producers. So what if you drop the citrus party bus assumption? Yeah, but that means, so I'd say citrus party bus, that the development of renewable electricity generation remains the same. This assumes if you drop this assumption that the electrolyzer produces, and that electrolyzer hydrogen producers also build themselves additional renewable electricity plants. But this is likely. So there's a scarcity on, for locations for to build wind farms, to, to build uh, solar parks. So there is an unused uh, space which is not used by others, will not be used by others. And this will only be used by because of these uh, hydrogen producers. And this is maybe the essence of the whole, the whole discussion. I believe many people are making the assumption that there's no shade of spanibus and that if you build, produce more hydrogen through electrolysis, we automatically also have more renewable electricity generation. But I doubt whether this is the case. And these are separate processes. Governments are pursuing the development of renewable electricity generation actively by subsidizing, etc. And this will happen, no matter what happens with uh, hydrogen production. And because this is an exogenous process, the development of renewable electricity, more hydrogen production just means a high demand for electricity. And that's why we need more additional capacity. And this additional generation capacity will largely come from gas fire generation because they are the most flexible power plants. That means gas used in industry for, for heating or so is being replaced by gas used for additional electricity generation. And someone else asks, so why are European governments continuing to promote this if it does not result in net emission savings? Really good question. Maybe a part of your answer is also what I quoted in the beginning of my presentation is an other objective of this policy besides when promoting the climate policy is also to promote the industry. And it can also result in more jobs, more employment.
seems to be a mixture of climate policy and industry policy. So we have uh, maybe we uh, should now end this uh, the webinar unless there are some really important last remarks. I see a remark by George. I have to read his comments. I believe I agree. 8,000 8, hours of electricity is not possible. A 100 renewable power system. I believe we will always need some cash fired power plants for the flexibility. So 100 uh, fossil fuel free system is not conceivable. And this will also make that we have, will have higher prices now and then. And these higher prices are really really important for investors in renewable energy. So by pursuing a 100% renewable electricity system, we make situation more complicated for reliability, but also for investments in renewable electricity. If you have 2,000 2, hours of cash fired dominated uh, power uh, hours, then we will have sufficient higher prices for a sufficient number of hours to make these investments profitable. Uh, I'm taking the last uh, comments before ending this uh, webinar, unfortunately because of the time. Uh, Anna refers to the geopolitical motives that can play a role. So this, I, and this, I see this that you have as an as a ambition to import less natural gas from uh, some countries. This is a motive that's really relevant in energy and climate policy. But the question is, do we really realize a lower amount of import of natural gas by promoting hydrogen. Because my idea is that we just shift the consumption of gas from the industry to the power sector because we are promoting electricity consumption. So by promoting renewable electricity generation, then indeed we will reduce the gas consumption. But that's a different topic. And the topic of today was promoting specific type of demand, which is demand for electricity for making hydrogen. So if you don't mind, I would like to, to thank you all for your participation, for all your questions. I would like to say, uh, to discuss further this topic. So if you have any further questions or you would like to send me some information, please feel free to send an email. I will, I will be happy to further discuss this topic with you. For now, thanks a lot for your participation. And I hand over to, to David in the USA. Thank you, Al. Thank you so much for this, uh, for this webinar. I mean, hydrogen is such a hot topic uh, right now particularly in Europe. And uh, we're very grateful for your thoughtful uh, analysis and presentation. For those of you listening, this webinar has been recorded. It will be available on our Rewind station this afternoon. Please tell your friends and colleagues that they may come and visit this complimentary. If you're not already a member of IAEE, we welcome you to join by visiting us at www.iaee.org. Wherever this finds you on our fine globe, I wish you a good rest of your day, and I officially close this webinar. Bye now.